Good evening and welcome to On the Campaign Trail. It is 12 days to Election Day. Since November, we have consulted dozens of experts and resource persons, campaign volunteers and candidates to try and make sense of the 2022 elections. We consulted them in the belief that the democratic project is in danger and that it isn't, it cannot be elections as usual. Tonight, we consider the elections from an international perspective. How do other countries see the May 9 elections? From my experience, we in the Philippines do not do enough comparative analysis. We usually consider political events without reference to what's happening in other countries. At best, we compare Philippine elections to those in the United States, which is massively different. At worst, we jump to the conclusion that yes, these things happen, quote unquote, only in the Philippines. It is important to think comparatively and we can usefully start by asking foreign correspondents what it is their audiences think of the Philippine elections. In 2022, hashtag we decide. Without neglecting the other basic questions, on the campaign trail, we'll focus on how we decide and why we decide. I'm John Neri, and you are on the campaign trail. You must have seen some of their work because while they report for international news organizations, their journalism also has an impact on the political scene that they cover. A photo that goes viral, a confrontational question asked live, a report on disinformation operations that ruffles feathers. And tonight they join us, journalists covering the Philippines and the Philippine elections for international news organizations. Howard Johnson has been the Philippine correspondent for the BBC since 2017. And Regine Cabato is the Philippine correspondent for the Washington Post since 2018. Howard, Regine, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Let's start by um, a question about the audience that you serve. Uh, what is the, your idea of the audience that you report for? And what do they expect from your reports about the Philippines? Maybe we can start with Regine and then Howard. Yeah. Um... I'm a reporter for the Washington Post. So uh, as you can expect, the reporters are mainly in the West, are mainly Americans, people who read our newspaper from DC, oftentimes big policymakers um, in the capital of uh, the United States, but also a lot of people across the country. And that also includes Filipino Americans, people who are tuning in to um, what's happening in the Philippines. But another curious thing, and I guess this comes with, you know, the agent premium now being um, placed on diversity, is because I'm Filipino um, and I was born and raised in the Philippines, uh, there is also an audience that comes with uh, my following who are also fellow Filipinos. Um, so a lot of uh, people who are here in the Philippines also end up reading and following um, my work. Howard, who is your audience and what do they expect from you? Well, BBC has been around for 100 years and, of course, many uh, news networks, uh, particularly broadcast journalists and journalism, follows really the BBC News model and now it's blown up. Everybody has their own national broadcaster, but BBC was the first to really um, show how it's done and it's gained a reputation over the years for being the network you turn to to find out what's really going on in many countries it was seen as a um the, the, the provider of truth unfiltered and unvarnished and sometimes uh, as raw as it comes really so we uh we have a, a an audience of uh, 350 million i believe per week is the reach um it's a, a huge audience all, all around the world on lots of different platforms online tv social media now as well and um, yeah, we have uh, obviously OFWs probably pick up on our on our content as well. 
Um, and we have seen the growth of our BBC News website um, in the last 10 years or so, and it's been one of the market leaders when it comes to news websites. How would your audience uh, describe what's really going on in the Philippines now, Howard? If you were to ask um, them, if I were to ask them, uh, what do you know about the Philippine elections? What do you think they'd say? Well, there's all, there was always this... Um, this question about what do people know about the Philippines? And the first thing that many British people say is Imelda's shoes, Imelda's shoe collection. That's really something that uh, maybe applies to other countries as well. Um, right. And so the, the current election is becoming very interesting for people because they're seeing um, history turn on its head. They've seen what happened in 86, um, told through BBC journalists on the ground. Uh, we had Brian Barron here in 84 reporting on the elections then and then again in 86. Um, uh, so Brian Hanrahan, Hanrahan actually in 84 and Brian Barron on the ground in 86 reporting on the people power revolution. So even me as a youngster watched that reporting. And so it was very, um, uh, it's almost like fate having watched that report that I ended up coming here and covering um, the rise of Bong Bong Marcos, who's obviously, you know, according to what some opinion polls, 30 percentage points ahead of Lenny Robredo at the moment. So uh, people are very fascinated by this story. They're interested to see how um, a family that were disgraced and uh, kicked, uh, d deposed from the Malacanang are now on the verge of returning. So that's something that's really interesting our audiences around the world. Uh, let's get back to the... Uh, to what you've been doing with old BBC clips uh, in a bit. Uh, but uh, Regine, I want to ask you, uh, what about your primary audience? Uh, what do you think uh, they would say in answer to the question, what do they know about the Philippine elections this year? It's pretty much the same as what Howard mentioned, Sir John. Um, the notoriety and corruption of the Marcuses is an internationally accepted and established fact. There is nothing alleged about it. It's only in the Philippines, very ironically, that this history is kind of being contested. Um, Marcus, member, Mar Marcus family members actually have, you know, standing cases um, in the United States, for example. Um, and of course, that comes with its own complicated history, given how U.S. leaders at the time didn't did enable the regime to an extent. Um, but there was also there were also court cases filed against them there. Um, so the return of the, the possible return of the Marcuses to power without any form of justice or accountability, whether through jail time or financial penalties, it would actually be unthinkable in any other functioning democracy or in any other country with a functioning justice system. And the world is looking very closely, I think, and very curiously at what is happening here um, in the Philippines because of that. Um, definitely, the upcoming election is going to be a test of the hold of truth um, on reality because of the disinformation that has been seeded for decades and um, spread online. Um, and we've always been, ever since 2016, we've been dubbed ground zero for the post-truth era. We've been called a petri dish for um, social media practices uh, that enabled the spread of this information. And definitely, it's going to be a big test this coming election as to whether or not we will continue down this path. Huh? Yes, I, uh, I, I think I do, I do agree with you. Uh, the Marcos name is the best known uh, uh, name from the Philippines uh, even, even today. Um, I wanted to ask, what aspect of Philippine politics is the hardest to explain to your international audiences? Maybe hard. Um, I, I, I think uh, one of the hardest things to explain is how um, deeply uh, scurrilous a lot of politicians here are, actually. Um, there are people who lie brazenly. Uh, they lie to your face and, and, and uh, you, you see them um, like weather vane politicians who one minute are supporting one cause and then switch to another. That's something you don't really see in the West so much. Uh, it's also very interesting to see how the uh, the remnants of the US colonial period and congressional style politics um, has really effectively failed the country because there is this uh, 
the, the way the, the House of Representatives works is it's like whoever's in power um, means that you have to run to the other side of the room to make sure that you can receive funding for your project. So there's, it's less about um, uh, policies and more about um, personalities. And personality politics is very difficult to explain to people. One thing I've noticed in particular is how um, a bridge that would be publicly funded um, and therefore just be a government bridge. In the Philippines, it's named after the politician who who um, was in power at the time. So the personality is injected into the bridge. Now, that, for me, that's uh, unreasonable because you build up a myth, you build up uh, an image uh, of an idol, and therefore it's very difficult to undo that. And I've also seen how people use uh, charity uh, to put their branding on the charity that they hand out so you're always seeing the personality being injected uh, into the politics so that you always remember the name of the candidate rather than just say the public funded this. This is a publicly elected official and they're doing the work on behalf of the people. How do you explain that to your uh, audience? I think, I think the most important thing is to um, show the examples of it, to see when a rice pack has a name branded across it or when a, poli a politician may be uh, running for office, um, but at the same time is uh, putting his uh, name across uh, a truck with water on the back of it, heading to a typhoon uh, relief zone. I think the most important thing is just to um, also apply uh, due impartiality to our uh, reporting of things. So if the law has been broken and has been proven to be broken, as regime was saying, you have the right to not do a he said, she said and sit on the fence. You are allowed to have due impartiality. You're allowed to tell the story with a bit more um, uh, of, of, a, of an onus on making sure that we're telling the story to the audience to show that crimes have been committed, democratic principles have been rubbished, and that you have to show that these things happen, but there is always a right of reply in there and there is the other side of the story, but it doesn't have to be 50-50. Thank you. Regine, what, what aspects of the Philippine elections are hard to, to explain to your audience? Well, there are three um, keywords, I would say, or buzzwords that I often end up using. I usually use a guess na minsan sa mga explainer about um, uh, politics in the Philippines. And, like Howard mentioned, one of them is personality um, mm -hmm. or sometimes showbiz slash entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, two, patronage. Um, three, political dynasties. These are the concepts that I usually end up integrating into my stories or into my reports in order to explain the larger context of how politics operates in the Philippines. Because a lot of problems, a lot of issues in this country um, and with our political system in general can be traced to those three things. Um, we're very, like Howard said, we're very personality um, driven culture. Um, and that is related as well to families, to, to dynasties, um, to a kind of um, feudal sort of system where we look up to um, where, where we look up to one family in power and then, that connects to patronage. Um, we have a culture where um, malakas pa rin yung, yung sense ng utang na loob, um, yung takot, yung sense na, ah, this, this politician or this family did something for me, um, therefore, um, I'm going to vote for them again, etc. Um, but it, we don't necessarily, or people on the ground don't necessarily um, view the things that these politicians do as their job, you know? Um, it, we kind of view sometimes the most basic public service as a gift, right? And it's very strange to other people, um, or very strange to foreigners, which has which have uh, where you know their countries could have um, a stronger system that guards against that. Uh, one thing I also often find myself having to explain to other people um, who are not familiar with the Philippine context is how weak the party system here is. We don't have our people don't have a very um, conventional um, or common knowledge of um, the spec the, po the pol political spectrum from left to right right um, we have party lists who are supposed to represent marginalized groups are supposed to represent minority groups but 
Um, they're basically hijacked by showbiz personalities, etc. And there are many academics who can um, explain this phenomenon more clearly than than, than I can. Um, but definitely because Filipinos are used to this type of circus, right? Um, sometimes it helps to have a bit of um, uh, an outsider point of view or also to have to, it's a bit of a helpful exercise to have to explain this to outsiders or foreigners because it really drives home how absurd um, a lot of the things that happen in the Philippines are. Some of them most tolerable sins um, in Philippine politics or in the news that we see um, would actually be completely intolerable in any other nation. Um, stuff like faking your diploma um, or um, you know, throwing a party um, under COVID. Um, these are things that, you know, in countries like Japan and Korea, for example, public officials would probably kneel um, to the public and apologize for. Um, or maybe in the West, they could even get, get sacked for it, right? Um, so it's kind of interesting to have that discussion. Um, and that's basically, those are basically the stuff that I find myself having to explain to people who are unfamiliar with their context. Yes, I think there was a case uh, involving a German minister. Uh, there was something wrong with his uh, PhD dissertation or something, and, and he had to resign. And, uh, but I, yeah. I, I find it hard to believe some, something like that will happen in the Philippines. Um, <laughs> can, we, can, we talk about some, uh, can we talk about access uh, for a bit? Um, as foreign correspondents, do you, enjoy, do you enjoy greater access or harder access? Uh, to the candidates uh, because you're representing the Washington Post or the BBC? Maybe Howard first? I have, to, I have to say this year hasn't been that easy. We, it's, it's been quite bureaucratic to get um, the paperwork. And each of the rallies have their own separate accreditation. So unless you've got someone working on that separately, it's a lot of, a lot of work to get into these events. So we have really um begged to get into some events and uh of course access has been something that's been um shown actually by rappler leanne's um a coverage of the uh of bong bong's rallies has been very um uh, she, he's always been surrounded by a, a wall of uh, red shirted bodies and because we've all put in our requests so all of the foreign media have asked for an interview with bong bong marcos but no one has um yet to to um be granted one so it was getting to the point where we're nearing the uh, election and really like to hear from him um and, and i've seen that obviously he hadn't attended um certain um tv debates because of the four he didn't like the format head to head um and so it, it came to the point where we realized that maybe there was a, a a policy perhaps to just keep him protected so when i went to the first rally his his proclamation rally I noticed this wall of red bodies around him as he moved in to the arena. So uh, when we went to uh, uh, Batangas recently, um, I just really uh, knew I only had a very small window to ask him a question. And so I think what, what was interesting about it was because I knew I had such short time, I had to be quite direct. And in, in the in British culture, we, we're not as deferential to politicians. We believe they should be... Um, uh, kept, you know, on the on the stove. They should be uh, uh, tested in the fire to see if they're really good enough. So um, uh, it may have come across as rude or uh, insulting to some people, but I was really just trying to, uh, um, among the, the the noise of the crowd and the and the stage, tried to get across my message as quickly as possible so I could get a response. Uh, but of course, it's been turned into this. Uh, narrative that I have been uh, colonial in my outlook and that I was disrespectful. Um, but this is a, a man who's going to be in control of uh, public uh, money. This is the taxpayer's money will go to a man whose father stole from the public purse. So that's a valid reason to ask a question. You really need to be able to ask a question like that. And, and I have seen in the coverage that though those journalists who would dare ask that question have not been granted access to him. Uh, and therefore, um, yeah, the access hasn't been perfect this time around. Regime? Um, I definitely think that the concern of access is also a product or um, it's affected by uh, 
the times, Sir John. Uh, we definitely know that the past six years have not been easy for journalists. There has been a volatile um, uh, atmosphere against us. We are not exactly favored, I would say. Um, uh, President Rodrigo Duterte has uh, um, not responded actually to any of um, the foreign correspondence associations' invitations to um, the typical traditional yearly press con that we have um, with the president. But my colleagues in the foreign press would actually say that even President Duterte was more accessible um, in the beginning of his term than Marcos Jr. currently is now. Um, so as our uh, as Howard has mentioned and as our press association president tweeted last night, um, a good number of us, myself included, did not receive a media accreditation um, to cover um, Bongbong Marcos's campaign despite complying with the deadline and the application requirements. On top of that, we have foreign journalists who are probably flying in um, from abroad for whom coverage the coverage process uh, because of this you know, very difficult media media cred uh, uh, bureaucracy is for them. It's more inaccessible and even more opaque, uh, right? Um, it's very difficult to get a hold of the Marcus campaign team. They've not uh, made schedules publicly available, or they don't respond to um, requests for comment, or you know, um, uh, or schedules even. Um, they're not exactly the most transparent when it comes to. Um, information and it's definitely concerning for somebody who's going to be running as president. He seems to be content to surround himself with vloggers and propagandists who can shape the narrative for him. He's evasive, um, and that's part of what worries a lot of us in the press about um, access in the coming um, in in the current um, campaign coverage, um, and also possibly um, in the coming months and years if he will win the presidency. So yeah, we can't um, have uh, candidates who are practically in an echo chamber. Uh, yes, in preparing for this episode, I, I was uh, stunned to find out that uh, there have been uh, news organizations that filed for accreditation with the Marcos campaign since February and up to now, and it's you know 12 days before election day have not received accreditation. So uh, you would be one of them, uh, Regine? Yeah. So what what, what can be done um, uh, to cover the uh, Marcos campaign the way it should be covered? Uh, is there some sort of uh, uh, inter-industry <laughs> Um, cooperation uh, that uh, you're working on to so that you can help each other cover the Marcus campaign? Um, uh, I'm not sure about um, uh, what my colleagues in the local if, uh, what my colleagues in the local press um, might have up their sleeves because um, uh, definitely they're on the front lines of this because the foreign press uh, we don't necessarily have to cover. Uh, the day-to-day, -day, right? We uh, mm -hmm. basically just need to um, shoot the most important things, report on the most important things. Um, uh, but we don't necessarily have to be there in every rally, um, uh, be there to retrieve every soundbite, um, because a lot of it gets sliced up for the foreign audience. Um, but definitely, I think that the press in general, both foreign and local, will have to regroup um, in the coming days or maybe after elections um, if Marcus Jr. wins, probably, um, to see how we can move forward if this will be the kind of atmosphere that will persist for, for the press. Um, uh, personally, one of the ways that I've tried to uh, um, uh, find my way around these types of restrictions is to take a look at the, the online trail of the Marcus campaign because mm -hmm. that's something that um, is very elaborate, very um, manufactured and new also, because it kind of shows the new um, heights or the new depths um, uh, that the disinformation machinery um, is taking. Um, so I haven't necessarily had to go out on the field um, uh, to gather that information because I've been mostly following um, mm -hmm. what the trends have been online, because that is a very huge um, front of the um, Marcus okay. campaign. So that, that's that's one way that I've gone about it. But of course, um, 
that's for one story. That's for one report. Uh, definitely, um, in the future, we're going to have to talk about the ways we can help each other out when it comes to covering new issues that will crop up. Howard, uh, these kinds of restrictions, uh, would they be in, of interest to your audience? I mean, is it worth a story? Uh, or is it merely you know, part of the context, uh, necessary conditions for covering Marcos? Well, I think in the coming weeks, the elections will ramp up, our coverage will ramp up because there'll be more people joining us from the BBC to um, co press as we call it, where you have a presenter talking to me uh, and we'll discuss these issues. But also, I think something that Regine said that's really important is not just the how, how the message is communicated um, on social media, but also how social media is used to denigrate and, uh, and attack journalists. So after uh, doorstepping, as we call it in the UK, we don't call it ambushing because we believe we have the right to doorstep uh, a, a politician to ask them questions if we're going to provide for them financially with our tax. Um, we, when I when I did the doorstep, uh, within days I have been, you know, absolutely denigrated with uh, death threats, uh, slashing my throat. To, today, one message just said "death" in in the message, and uh, I'm being hit at a, an unconventional rate. And I've experienced this before in 2018. So this is something where it feels like it's coordinated, and we know about coordinated inauthentic behavior we've all seen the, mm -hmm. the the diagrams how that works and so what's what's happening is a coordinated inauthentic attack that starts with people creating um uh, vlogs and then the vlog uh, sees the message which the trolls then take on and copy and paste and put everywhere and then the public feel um that it's okay then to you know say i'm being a, a foreign meddler or i'm a colonialist or I'm a racist, or uh, all sorts of other slurs, and and it's it's sad really because that um, that's something I I will talk about. It's something that that I have talked about before about doing journalism here. I've, I wrote a dispatch which ended up being in a book in the UK that you can you know you can buy a copy of it. It's called uh, Dispatches of the Decade from Our Own Correspondent, and in on the back page I, I made the back page as one of the featured writers for getting trolled relentlessly in 2018 so that's one of the most important and interesting things is what uh you know the ethics and the standards of the country and how is the world going to see the philippines if there's all this violence and this horrible language um swirling around truth tellers just trying to look for um trying to tell the truth about um the state of politics in the philippines um, I'm, I'm very sorry that you're going through this, and Regine also because of uh, yeah. recent work that you've you've done or published uh, or aired. Uh, just a quick language note: uh, I, I do agree with you. Ambush interview is an unfortunate term. Uh, I think we can trace uh, its roots uh, to the Cory Aquino presidency. That's when it first uh, uh, surfaced. I think chance interview uh, would be a better term. Uh, but I really like the, the term that you use, doorstepping. Uh, and in fact, that's that's the reason why you're, um, you've come under so much uh, uh, you know, hate from Marcos supporters because you were on the figurative doorstep of his campaign and you were shouting out the question, are you hiding something? How can you be a serious person if you don't do uh, uh, serious interviews? Uh, and Regine, you, you've also been on the receiving end because of your recent report on disinformation on uh, on TikTok. You know the uh, what what they're doing uh, there. Um, can you can you both you know just walk us through? Uh, so Howard already started, but can you walk us through the experience? What is it like to be? inside this uh you know it's inside the barrel so to speak you know, uh when people are shooting at you it's so insane sir john actually you were one of um our quoted sources remember for that particular story um but basically for those of you who, who aren't familiar with that report which um i think in philippine and the filipino internet went a bit viral um we found out that the marcus revisionism project 
has actually been decades in the making. And it's branched out from Facebook, which we have we've already seen revisionist posts on Facebook as early as 2016. But it's branched out to other places like YouTube and TikTok. Um, and in YouTube's case, it's actually some content, some pro Marcos content has actually been there for even longer. Um, the report kind of delves into um, an updated look at how troll farms and the disinformation machinery operates, um, how much influencers get paid, what type of content they produce, um, and also the kind of um, very dystopian but also um, sleekly edited, um, very um, Gen Z tailor fit uh, stuff that come out on TikTok. Um, so there are several talk points that we go through in that article. And um, when we put it up online and I posted a bit of a summary um, of it for um, Filipino audiences, that kind of went viral. And then I came on the receiving end of online attacks. First, very strangely, through LinkedIn. Um, and then it kind of bled over um, to Facebook, where I basically got bombarded with um, message requests and laugh reacts. Um, I haven't opened my comment sections because I have been through harassment campaigns before and they're very draining to deal with, to be honest with you. Um, but this time around, I felt like I couldn't just sit around and, you know, just take it. So I took a screen recording of uh, the message requests that came in and kind of invited people to walk through my inbox with me to kind of drive home to my followers the idea of what it's like to be a journalist in this kind of atmosphere. And um, uh, from what I've seen so far, so far, there have been no death or rape threats, but there have been a lot of pretty ugly um, messages, um, digs at my credibility. And that has been um, definitely a tactic um, that those who hate truth tellers, that those who hate the press have been trying to do. Like they definitely try to break um, your resolve as a journalist. They um, try to smear you, basically call you all these things, say that you're not good at your job, etc. Um, I think I can take this because it's already, I can take this a lot better because it's already been um, around my third uh, harassment campaign. Um, but definitely, I have to say, Sir John, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and it is a distraction from the main job of reporting. Actually, Howard and I were talking about it earlier. Um, there needs to be a support system in place for journalists. And these are very much risks. Um, Maria Ressa earlier said um, in a Twitter exchange that the two of us had that um, online attacks are real life attacks. Um, people might give like very offhanded um, threats, uh, you know, implying and it could be empty, but they're also very real. Um, they make the job more difficult, for sure. Howard. Hi. Hi. Thanks for uh, coming back. Um, Howard, I wonder, um, is there a difference uh, between the attacks that you received uh, from Duterte supporters and the attacks, the attacks that you're receiving now from Marcos supporters? Um, or is it all the same? Um, I... I, I can't, I don't really know the science behind it, but I would say that it's very similar. It feels like the same machinery. Uh, all of this stuff is in the ether. You can't really grasp at it. And that's what's uh, obviously frustrating because it's up to Meta and uh, Facebook to really look into why they continue to allow this stuff to happen. Because uh, you, you wouldn't uh, accept that um, saying those things to someone on the street. So why would you allow someone um, to write stuff like we're going to slash your throat? I think that when you look at the balance of it, um, you know, the, the question I ask versus the response is completely uh, out of whack. It's um, it's basically, as Maria Ressa has said before, bludgeon, you know, designed to bludgeon you into silence. It's designed to make you step away and say, oh, I don't want to do that again. Um, and um, I think uh, this this issue will continue to be a problem and, and will need to be addressed because truth tellers um, are being uh, targeted and the, the techniques uh, haven't changed one bit. They're exactly the same. They're nasty. Uh, they're vindictive. They flood every single social media platform you have and you'll find comments 
uh, hidden away on old posts um, that are threatening or or dark or use you know awful language. And uh, it's funny, it's ironic really because I was uh, you know said that I was rude or disrespectful, but I didn't swear and I didn't um, and I'm not threatening. So uh, go figure. Yeah, um, the silver lining in this very dark cloud, I think, is uh, this means that uh, the work that you did uh, uh, had an impact. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you, do you set out to write stories or air stories uh, that would, I think it's, it's, it's also now to say it in the Philippines, move the needle uh, as far as uh, the Philippine elections are concerned? Or it's really just uh, a side effect. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely not. When it comes to this idea of um, you know meddling in in foreign politics, it's interesting because we're called the British Broadcasting Corporation. But I'm I'm not much of a nationalist. I well, I'm not at all. You'll never see me waving a British flag. I there's all this talk about uh, being a co colonial ag aggressor, and I completely disagree with our colonial past. Uh, in fact, if you can read a good book. I would recommend picking up Empire Land, which really analyzes the sins of the past of the UK and, and um, when it came to the colonial period. Um, I've just always been interested in truth. You know, I, I really enjoy uh, when you can smell um, a rat. I like to uh, go after that and, and try to get to the bottom of it. And I think that's the issue really with um, a lack of truth and reconciliation. Like in South Africa, you had maybe closure on some of the worst mm -hmm. abuses of apartheid, but in the Philippines, you didn't have that. And therefore you have like open sores that never heal. And that's why this stuff goes on and on and spins around. Um, for me, it's important when I came here to, to read as much as I could to read whistleblower accounts about what happened in the past. I even you know read this book as well to see the, the opposite uh, side of the story to see if it's uh, which one works in the balance. And so I'm keeping myself informed uh, always. And uh, and I speak to reporters who are here in the 1980s and ask them how they saw it. Uh, I read articles from the LA Times, Washington Post from the 1980s. They're fascinating. WikiLeaks have lots of good stuff as well about uh, all, all politicians, actually. So uh, sure. Just keep yourself informed and read and uh, inform yourself and you'll the truth will be there if you look for it. Regine, do you get uh, story ideas from from uh, Washington, D.C. or everything is generated from the Philippine side? Um, actually, it's a little bit of both. Um, but more recently, I would say that um, our more recent stuff are from my bitches and from my own research. I think I have a good grasp of what's expected of me here as a locally hired um, foreign reporter. Um, definitely the Foreign Press Association was, it, we were actually founded in the martial law years and we were a pocket for press freedom um, in a period when the press was censored. And in a way, up until today, the foreign press were cautioned from risks like self-censorship um, which is affecting a lot of the local press right now because of the volatile atmosphere we're in. Um, and we don't also have to pander to a lot of local officials or, you know, um, the, the local patronage culture because we don't have to worry about, um, you know, constantly seeking access. So that's the advantage um, that the foreign press reporter has. And I, I do have a good understanding of the privilege that I have uh, by holding this position. I think that um, I and the, the rest of my colleagues in the foreign press have a role to play. Um, and those in the local press also have a role to play. Um, and I'm really glad to see that um, hopefully we can, uh, we help each other out sometimes and I hope we will continue to, to do so. Um, definitely some of the stories that I come up with or that I pitch, um, they come in long form because I have the luxury of time to pursue these stories. I don't have to worry about, you know, covering breaking news every day or having um, deliverables constantly. I can concentrate on investigative stuff, really deep dives um, for months on end. Um, and hopefully people appreciate the work that comes out of that. Um, one of the things also that I kind of noticed is that 
um, like I mentioned earlier, um, sometimes when we're we live in the Philippine context, we're so used to the the circus around us. So um, uh, sometimes when I have to write about all the, these absurdities for the foreign audience, it really tends to hit a nerve. Um, but I think that definitely says a lot about us <laughs> and mm-hmm. about our local um, culture of politics. Thanks. Maybe just a couple more um, questions, if you don't mind. Um, is your audience interested in politicians other than Marcos? Is there a uh, desire to read, for instance, uh, about uh, Robredo mm-hmm. or uh, Moreno? Um, early on in the campaign, definitely, I think Manny Pacquiao was um, of interest mm-hmm. to foreign audiences. Not just not just right. for the post, but in general, mm-hmm. because he was the recognizable name for That's foreigners, right? right? Um, but since the campaign has progressed, definitely it's become more of a, um, it's steadily becoming, um, according to analysts, more of a two-way race between Marcus Jr. and Vice President Lenny Robredo. Um, before going on to that, though, I would also say that there's a lot of international interest with vice presidential candidate Sarah Duterte because she's also a dynasty kid. She's the daughter mm-hmm. of um, President Duterte. And I actually just recently came up with a profile of her that was published um, earlier today. Um, so you guys can also check that out at the Washington Post. Um, definitely, she's a more complex figure than her father, given that she's you know a woman. Um, and she also carries you know the uh, um, uh, a pressure and in a way her own mystique, according to her um, supporters. Um, so she's definitely somebody that the um, international watchers will or what are keeping an eye on. Um, but definitely recent weeks have seen the pull um, and the unprecedented volunteerism um, that opposition candidate Robredo has inspired. Um, and I think that foreign watchers are interested in that as well because it kind of opens up a possibility for um, a future after populism, you know, or how you respond to it. Um, Robredo's campaign has been playing on the radical love theme, which was first used in Turkey. Um, and it's going to be tested out here in the Philippines. Yeah. Howard, what about uh, the geopolitical angle? Um, is that of interest to your audience, the looming possibility that under a Marcos presidency, uh, we would be definitely realigned with China, for instance? Uh, is that something uh, they would be interested in? Well, geopolitics is uh, always interesting for BBC audience. And I think uh, you might have seen last year, uh, Vima and I went to um, Scarborough Shoal to look mm-hmm. at what was happening there. And that's a, that's obviously a very uh, hot topic during these elections. Uh, I think uh, candidate Bello tried to go out there recently to uh, highlight the blockade of Scarborough Shoal. Um, one of those really interesting um, territorial um, issues, given that uh, many people say that it's okay to fish there. But what, what we notice is you're, you can fish on the outside of the shoal, but try to go into the lagoon and you'll be chased away. And this lagoon, when you go there and see it, it's the size of Manhattan Island. It's massive. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's hundreds of f- football pitches um, mm-hmm. uh, big. So all the big fish swim inside there and there's only one entry point um so there's always this um uh misconception that because the fishing boats are on the outside they're getting the same access they used to have M- many fishermen told me they like to shelter inside uh, the shoal so yes uh, in the months ahead the poli- the geopolitics might shift and therefore you will see perhaps more pressure on the mutual defense treaty and the visiting forces agreement and um, and I, I'm quite sure that we will see more. I mean, I think Rodrigo Duterte also paved the way with the FDI um, uh, relaxation uh, measures recently as well. So maybe there will be more um, investment from uh, foreign countries as well. And that will um, see the geopolitical angle become more interesting for a world TV audience. Thank you. I'm afraid uh, we've run out of time. Uh... Howard Johnson of the BBC, Regine Cabado of the Washington Post, thank you uh, very much for 
your time, your insights, and the courage and clarity of your work. Thank you. Maraming salamat. Thank you for having us. Salamat. That's it for us tonight. Join us again next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Follow us closely on the campaign trail because it isn't just elections as usual. This is John Neri. Good night. Thank you.